with the Ode to Newfoundland. Before you stand, we're going to do it a little bit differently. It's been a long time since we've heard the second and third verse. So we're going to ask everybody to join in the singing of the first verse. And the inland singers and performers are going to sing the second and third verse. We'll all join in the singing of the last verse. Please stand for the Ocean Play. <laughs> Today. I just want to say that I think all of the people taking part in the program today have a unique, have a unique connection with the railway. Monty is the great grandson of what tradition has of the first permanent settler in the town of Whitburn, Mr. Mansfield Pennypaw of Acadian descent who came here late in 1882, a railroad. So I'll call upon Acting Mayor Pettipaw for the welcome. Thank you, Mr. Goss. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and invited guests. On behalf of the Whitburn Town Council, I would like to welcome everyone here today. I understand we have people here from different parts of the country and all across our province. It is nice to see such support for this special occasion. We would like to commend the Heritage Society for initiating this project for paying tribute to those railroad workers who lost their lives. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our volunteer fire department for helping in the painting of the train cars. I hope you enjoy your stay in Whitburn, and I encourage you to view the sites that our historical town has to offer. Thank you.
18 pages. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Most people here know me. My name is John Cox, and I've been with the Heritage Society since 1983. And it's my honor to, uh, to have a little chat, not to lecture or give a history of the railway. Your worship, clergy, distinguished guests, rail motors, family members, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I want to say that this is the fourth major event for the Whitburn Heritage Society. In 1983, we established our town's first museum. It's been functioning ever since and growing stronger. Last year, we officially unveiled a replica of Sir Robert Bond's house known as the Grange. We unveiled that in April 1997. It was taken from us in 1953. We hope to see it put back in a few years. We were also involved in the unveiling of our town's history board that the Johnson Foundation gave a lot of support to. Today is our fourth event of unveiling. But today is rather special. It's a day of celebration and a day of thanksgiving. For we celebrate the fulfillment of an idea that was casually contemplated back in September 1995. Three years later, we meet here today. It is one of the Thanksgiving. These special moments this afternoon gives each one of us the opportunity to reflect upon the accomplishments of those who labor to lay foundations for this beloved place they call Newfoundland. For they too had a dream. Hardy laborers all who laid the ties and the tracks, the rails, and ran the trains that open the untrodden interior of this vast island. For that great enterprise was the first time that Newfoundlanders looked not only to the sea for their sustenance, but inwards to the development of the resources of the forest, the land, and the mines. Great were their challenges then, tragic were their deaths. That is why we're here today, to honor and to remember and to pay tribute to those pioneer builders who lost their lives in a once great noble enterprise. For Whitburn, the first permanent inland town for many years on this island, the railway holds a special place. Once the headquarters of the Reed Company. From here, the railway wended its way in a narrow gauge fashion to Port Bass on the western coast. <coughs> Indeed, next week, Port of Ask will begin a week of celebrations, marking the 100th anniversary of the crossing of the first passenger train 100 years ago. We wish them well in their celebrations. But I want to say here, seriously, <coughs> that all of the towns in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador 
we must be magnanimous enough and realize that there is ample railway history to be shared by other towns. A word of caution. Development, not just to lure the tourist dollar, though that will happen, but more importantly, to preserve our cultural heritage for our own people and for others to appreciate. Our history needs to be told and taught in our schools and not thrown out. Today's generation need to know from whence they came so that they will be more certain of where they're going. Today is a day to remember many of these young men, many of them fathers who lost their lives. This memorial plaque will help perpetuate that memory. Ladies and gentlemen, though the old train bell and whistle have been silenced, the sounds of the wheel clicking upon rail joints, and the echoes of all aboard taxi man are no more. But yet the lure and the romance of the railway runs deep in the veins of many of the older railroaders here today who well remember. The voices of those railway builders awakens a distant dream. But this monument is the result of many healthy hands and big hearts. It happens to be my pleasure to have had the cooperation of every member of the Heritage Society, the CN Pensions Association, who went beyond the extra mile, the Town Council of Whitburn, who have always been a strong supporter and continues to be, Canadian National, with their generous contribution, and many contributors in the audience here today. All of you have made this come true. It is a great achievement, not just for Whitburn, but for the whole province. In conclusion, on this 21st day of June, Father's Day. We celebrate and give thanks for yesterday's heroes. Those railroaders who dared to dream and dared to make their beloved home a better place for their children. Thank you for listening and God bless all of you. I'm going to call upon Mrs. Olive Northworthy, member of our society, to recognize and introduce our guest, Mrs. Northworthy.
Mr. Eric Terrell of the Faculty of Federal Heritage Corporation, Mr. James Madigan, President of the CN Petroners Association, Mr. Douglas Peters, with whom we worked on the design of the Memorial Park, Mr. Wade Smith, Chairman of the Local Improvement District of our neighbor community of Merkham. Dr. Gordon Hancock of the Monument Board of Canada could not be here, but sends his congratulations to all involved in this project. The liaison between the Whitburn Heritage Society and CN Pension were Mr. Ralph Perry and Mr. Lamont Jordan. Now we are going to say greetings from the guest. And the first one is Mr. John Whalen. Our MHA on behalf of the Premier and Governor. ceremony that we're here to, uh, to partake in. The Newfoundland Railway certainly one of the greatest transportation systems that we've had in, in our history. It's caught, it captured the imagination of all types of people, songwriters, painters, poets. It plays a great part in the history of this province and indeed is part of our heritage. The people who were involved in the railway certainly were played a great part in the development of Newfoundland and Labrador down through the years. I think it's very fitting that we should be here today to dedicate this plaque in their name. Premier Tobin has asked me to send his regrets that he couldn't be here, but he certainly shares in your enthusiasm and your dedication to the memory of the people who helped build the railway as a great transportation system and certainly one of the greatest single influences of the development of this, this province. As I said before, I'm delighted to be here, it's certainly an honor and a pleasure, and I want to congratulate the Council and the Historic Society for the, their enthusiasm and their dedication to the memory of all those workers. Thank you very much. For that. previous commitment in Ottawa pre uh, prevents him from uh, making the trip down. He did ask me, however, to pass on to you, on to you his very warmest greetings and best wishes. I am honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today at the unveiling dedication of this railway memorial. While trains no longer run in Newfoundland, they are vivid in our minds. Who can forget the new people? Minister Mifflin has a framed photo of the Newfie Bullet in his Ottawa office and will wax poetic when asked of its significance. The railway provided a necessary link between the communities of our province in times when other forms of transportation were still in the most primitive form. Personally, I can remember packing up my car and kit bag to cross the island, singing all the way. This was entertainment at its simplest and purest form. Railway travel gave a sense of community. Lifelong uh, friendships were forged on the train trip across the island. And while passengers enjoyed the comforts and ease of the trip, the railroaders worked to ensure the journey was safe for all aboard. But let me tell you, it wasn't always so. I have personal memories of a tragic accident that occurred in 1967. I was first on the scene of an accident I saw firsthand the role that the railroaders played. It was a traumatic <coughs> event for me as a bystander 
and I'm sure it was even more traumatic for those involved in the accident. It's all too easy to dismiss the major role that railroaders play to ensure the safety of its passengers. It's all too easy to forget the many railroaders who lost their lives in carrying out that role. Today, as we dedicate the Railway Memorial, let us remember those railroaders who were killed in the line of duty. I want to take this opportunity to uh, pass on to the Heritage uh, Society uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much. requirements of many of the industries that are here on the island. Canadian National is undergoing some significant changes that are geared towards growth. As many of you may know, we have recently acquired a U.S. railway which now gives us access and service to three ocean uh, bodies, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and now the Gulf of Mexico. So as I said, while we no longer are physically here, the services that we provide particularly in a true intermodal fashion of truck, water, and rail, still play an important part for the Newfoundland industry. And so we're very pleased to be here and also to be a part of the recognition of those who worked so very hard and lost their lives over the years. We are still one of one of the greatest railroad industries in the world. Thank you very much. Applied, 
to the review finance company to get a half fare ticket or a ticket for free. Uh, and I don't know how successful they were, but uh, anyway, they all showed up. And the first item on the agenda was a condemnation of the review finance company for allowing their steamers, when they came into the port, to blow their whistle between 11 and 12. Because as soon as the uh, vessel docked, everybody got up and left, uh, usually just before collection. Uh, and the clergy were very unhappy uh, about this, but as so many people worked for the railway, they, uh, had, there wasn't much they could do about it. But the letters back from the uh, uh, congregations or the people that were there to the government to try and enforce uh, no blowing of whistles during sermons from then on. Uh, I think you've done a great job in setting up this celebration, and I wish you well in the years ahead building up your museum. And uh, on behalf of my wife and me, thank you very much indeed.
final speaker will be Mr. Frederick Russell, father of Lieutenant Russell, and the man of that world, whose father, the late Colonel J. Russell, was general manager of the railway for many years. Chairman, Reverend Perchie, Your Worship, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My wife and I are very pleased to be able to attend this important ceremony to honor the memory of all railroaders in Newfoundland who were killed in the line of duty. Whitmore, as we all know, played a prominent role in the early development of the railway in Newfoundland and Settlement Hill, where our very first inland town actually began when the construction of the railway line from St. John's reached this area in 1883. The story of the railway in Newfoundland covers a period of 107 years of operation, and this can properly be structured into three distinct phrases. The first, mainly under the Reed Newfoundland Company, lasted for 40 plus years from 1881 to 1923. The second, operating as a Newfoundland railway under the government of Newfoundland, lasted for 26 years from 1923 to 1949. And the third and last phase was from 49 to the close down of the railway on September 30, 1988 period of 39 years. My father, Herbert Russell, was involved in the first two phases of the railway. He was born and spent his early years in the tiny fishing community of Musgrave Harbor. At the age of 14, he moved with his parents to St. John's, where he completed his schooling. At the age of 16, in 1906, he commenced work with the Reed Newfoundland Company as a messenger and a sonographer. Over the next few years, his advancement was quite rapid, and at the age of 32, in 1923, when the railway was taken over by the government of Newfoundland, he was appointed general manager. He continued as general manager for the next 26 years, until February 26, 1949, when he unfortunately died. This was just one month prior to Newfoundland becoming part of Canada on April 1st, 49, and my father had been slated to become the first general manager when the railway was to be operated by a Canadian man. The Second World War placed an enormous strain on the operation of the railway. During the period 1939 to 45, the railway carried over five and a quarter million tons of freight and more than two and a quarter million passengers. All this was accomplished with inadequate rolling stock and deteriorating railway infrastructure. Throughout the war years, my father worked night and day and Sundays and holidays to keep the railway operating. This demanding job and the physical and mental strain over a period of nearly six years took a heavy toll on him, and I have no doubt whatsoever that it directly resulted in his early death at the age of 58. I would like to think, therefore, and especially on this Father's Day, that although my father wasn't killed in the line of duty working on the railway, his early death was a direct result of his dedication and the heavy burden of trying to keep the railway operating during the difficult war years. It's for this reason, and also to remember those who were killed in the line of duty, that my wife and I are honored to be with you today. And my congratulations go to the Whitford Heritage Society for bringing on this wonderful ceremony today. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to the 
all of the previous speakers. Each one took a different viewpoint. That gives us all a good perspective of the role of the railway. I'd like us to read a little story there about the bell or the whistle upsetting the, upsetting the church and the clergy. To lighten the moment a little bit, in all of the frantic effort to get the site prepared for this week, a couple of funny things happened, I guess, in a lighter moment. My glasses keep getting mislaid, and when I mislay them, because I can't see, I don't find them. And I don't have them on in order to find them. And secondly, uh, we were busy there one day and working near the station, and I came home afterwards, and I met one of the local residents on bike, I think he's here this afternoon, and he said, Mr. Goss, did, did you leave anything down near the station? I said, I don't think so. I got my glasses on, I don't see anything that I left down. I was a mile away at the time. And uh, he said, your shoes are down there. <laughs> well, they were, they were, when I went down, the only thing on the parking lot were the shoes that I'm wearing this afternoon. They were neatly put together, but they were facing the right direction. They were facing Whitburn. So my shoes were left down there. So sometimes these things happen. I uh, just give us a moment or two to get the microphone brought down on the lower level. Uh, Mr. Peddle will accompany me now and we'll proceed with the unveiling, the reading of the names and the dedication. red I usually think is dangerous. <laughs> the OCN is not dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a reason for the various people taking part in the program. And on my immediate right here is Mr. Ralph Peddle. Uh, Mr. Ralph Peddle was the last employee at the railway station in Whitburn. He helped cut the ribbon for the opening of the museum and the railway station. And more importantly, he took on the role this uh, winter of being our special treasurer, looking after our donations and sending out receipts. And so we want to say thank you, Mr. Peddle, by asking him to assist the Heritage Society to unveil the memorial plaque. Mr. Peddle. interesting story connected with each one of them. A most unique story, I think. The articles at the back of the hall, when you get a chance this afternoon, refers to the first spike on the railway being driven by Mr. Henry Kilpatrick, formerly of St. John, New Brunswick, later resident of Whitburn for many years, where he lived and died. 
assisting us in the reading of the first column of names is the grandson of Mr. Henry Kilpatrick. Will you please welcome Mr. Gerald Kilpatrick all the way from British Columbia. Cahill, Joseph King, Ambrose Collins, Moses Courage, Harry Cranford, John Day, Edward Dunn, James Eales, John Fitzpatrick, James Flynn, Thomas Foley, George Fury, Hayward Gale, Fred Glasgow, Michael Gorman, Harold Harris. Thank you, Mr. Kilpatrick. Another unique story to our second gentleman. All of you, I think, are familiar with the statue to industry in front of the railway station in St. John's. That statue was molded and sculptured by Charles Henderson of Scotland, who worked for the Reeds as a bridge builder, railroader, the lady that worked in the Henderson household, aged 24, was a Miss Frances Quinlan of North Arm Holy Rood. Miss Quinlan modeled for the statue. She later married a John Guju of Whitburn. Miss, Mrs. Guju lies buried in the cemetery just across the street from this location today. It is a great honor to ask her son, Mr. George Bougie, a CN employee for many years, to read the second list of names. Mr. Bougie. Miss Linda Burry. And Linda comes from a long line of railroaders in her, in her dad's family, in her mother's family, and many uncles who work at the railway. So I'm going to call on one of the grade 12 students, Linda Burry, to read the third column. James Saunders, James Shea, Gerald Shahan, Thomas Smith, William Smith, Herbert Snellgrove, Edward Stanley, Herbert Strath, David Sullivan, Ambrose Taylor, William Tilly, Frederick Tipple, Edward Wall, Ambrose Wall, Thomas Welsh, Arnold Weber, Harry Wells, Harold White, Stephen White, and John Mythical. Thank you, Lynn. 
Washington, the reading on the plaque in memory of those railroaders who lost their lives in the line of duty during the years of the railway era in Newfoundland. Project initiated by the Whitburn Heritage Society with major support from the Whitburn Town Council, the Sea and Pensions Association, Canadian National, June 21, 1998. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand for a moment of silence. Please be seated. I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon for the dedication part, Father Douglas Barrett, Father John Adeniwa. I know I didn't say that right, but that's my best and Lieutenant Hillier, if you three would just come up here and to the ceremony, okay? representing the United Church. Thank you, Marilyn. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, God of peace, God of justice, you are our hope, Lord, and our strength. Make yourself real to us as we struggle in our everyday world and to be faithful in our struggle. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for those whose lives we celebrate today who have toiled and struggled to build this great land in which we live. And we especially thank, Lord, and acknowledge those who have worked and toiled in our railway. We thank and acknowledge those today who labor on to build a better world for us. We ask your continued blessing on all who work in industry and labor in this province. We pray for our provincial and federal leaders, Lord, that they will be guided as they make decisions that affect all of us who toil for you. Make our leaders and us, and all of those gathered here this evening, aware of your presence in every aspect of our lives. We ask this prayer, Lord, in your holy name. to thank you for your love and for your protection. You formed us from the earth and gave us strength from above. And our forefathers worked hard to provide for us. It is now our turn also to fight on. We need strength. We need courage. We need love and support for one another. We ask you to keep us safe now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray.
have put it into the hearts and minds of your faithful people. To ever bear in their memory and to honor with their lives those who have gone before. <coughs> Today we gather in thy presence to remember those who gave of their very selves and their very lives for our continued progress and prosperity. And now, Father, we bless and dedicate in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit this memorial plaque. Grant that all reading the names inscribed thereon may ever bear in mind the debt of gratitude which we owe to those who have gone before and the great debt of responsibility that we owe to those who come after. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Father God, we continue to pause in your presence and we give you thanks for allowing us to do so. And Father, we thank you for all that's transpired here this afternoon. And we pray, oh God, that you would bless those who continue to remind us and to instill in our hearts and our minds the past, the history that we hold dear to our hearts. And we pray, oh God, for the memories that you give to us. We pray just now, Lord, and we think about the words that Paul wrote in Philippians. I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward. We pray just now, Lord, that you would continue to touch us, that you would continue to move in our lives. Bless us all, we pray, in Jesus' name. certainly welcome you and all other families here today. I thought I'd like to mention that 17 all the way from Bonavista distant various places. <laughs> now I'd like to call upon <laughs> call upon Mrs. Eileen Foley Huss, daughter of a railroader for many, many years. Call upon Eileen to give the vote of thanks. <laughs> Society. It is my honor and privilege to thank all who participated in the program this afternoon. All those who financially helped in any way, you can see a list of contributors on the wall to the right of the Those helping to prepare the site and painting the railway cars. The Whitburn Town Council, CN pensioners, CN, our heritage members, and many, many individuals. Our media and publicity chairman, Kevin Hutchings. And thank you, Ian Hutchings, for doing our video today. <coughs> All the ladies who prepare food. The inland singers and performers, choir, and this is Cecilia Malawi. The Whitburn volunteer firemen, the RCMP, and the RNC for all of their help here today. The school administration for the use of their copier and other facilities all year. To the clergy for their invaluable help today. The representatives of our youth organizations, our cadets, our CLB, 
the brownies and the sparks. To Lewis Tuttle and Sons for their beautiful masonry work at the site. To Mr. Doug Peters for his excellent workmanship and cooperation in getting this beautiful memorial plaque done. We especially like to say a special thank you to everyone who came from near and far to share in this historic event this afternoon. <coughs> now I would like to call upon Mrs. Sylvia Gilbert to introduce our choir. Thank you very much.
Seated just for a second, please. Mr. Carver, can you come up for a minute, please? Mr. Ernest. I'm going to ask our vice president of the Heritage Society, Mr. Ernest Carville. <coughs> Mr. Carville, if you would escort the officials on stage, the people taking part in the reading of the names, the clergy, invited guests, escort them to the lunchroom, please. Saying to you earlier, don't everybody take off the lunch from first. It's quite a crowd here, beyond our expectations. We'll eventually get there, we hope. The library's open, two classrooms are open. There's a big parking lot. You can also bring your food back here in the gymnasium. Again, we are overjoyed to see such a crowd. We hope that you all have a safe journey home. So if you follow Mr. Carver there, please, and everybody can move out on the road now. Want to go for the center royal, Mr. Kirk? Sure. For the center royal? Okay, no problem. I'll walk down that way, I'll go. There's nothing left for bringing it up, I heard it.
Yeah, we already got two. And uh, oh my God, somebody is more in Burnham.